Good morning everybody and welcome back to Worksheet Cloud and to your Grade 7 English lesson. My name is Mrs. Beaujé and I'm super excited to be able to be teaching you online. Remember if you do have any questions you can email me at grade7 at worksheetcloud.com. Right, so we are continuing with our beautiful novel War Horse. We only have three chapters to go so we're going to jump straight in to chapter 19. Remember in chapter 18, it was awesome the way it ended. Um, Joey had gotten better. He was on the um, borderline of um, succumbing to tetanus. We get locked jaw and everything starts stiffening up. But he has survived. And so we start chapter 19. But the war did not end. Instead, it seemed to move even closer to us. And we heard once again the ominous rumble of gunfire. My convalescence was almost over now. And although still weak from my illness, I was already be being used for light work around the vet hospital. I worked in a team of two, hauling hay and feed from the nearest station or pulling the dung cart around the yard. I felt fresh and eager for work once more. My legs and shoulders filled out and as the weeks passed, I found I was able to work longer hours in harness. Sergeant Thunder had detailed Albert to be with me whenever I was working that we were scarcely ever apart. But from time to time though, Albert, like all the vet orderlies, would be dispatched to the front with the vet wagon to bring back the latest horse casualties and then I would pine and fret, my head over the stable door until I heard the echoing rumble of the wheels on the cobbles and saw his cheery wave as he came in under the archway and into the yard. What a special friendship between the two had. In time, I too went back to the wall back to the front line, back to the wine and wall of the shelves that I'd hoped I'd left behind me forever. Fully recovered now and the pride of Major Martin and his vet unit, I was often used as a lead horse in a tandem team that hauled the vet wagon back and forth to the front. But Albert was always with me, and so I was never afraid of the guns anymore. Like Topthorn before him, he seemed to sense that I needed a continual reminder that he was with me and protecting me. His soft, gentle voice, his songs and his whistling tunes held me steady as the shells came down. All the way there and back, he would be talking to me to reassure me. Sometimes it would be off the wall. David said, Jerry is about finished. Shot his bolt, he said one hammering summer's day, as we passed line upon line of infantry and cavalry going up to the front line. We were carrying on exhausted, we were carrying an exhausted grey mare, a water carrier that had been rescued from the mud at the front. Fair knocked us for six, he did, further up the line, they say. But David says that that was their last gasp, that once those Yankees find their fighting legs, and if we stand firm, that it could all be over by Christmas. I hope he's right, Joey. He usually is. Got a lot of respect for what David says. Everyone has. And sometimes he would talk of home. And his girl up in the village. Macy Cobbledick, she's called Joey, works in the milking parlour up Anstain Farm. And she bakes bread. Oh, Joey, she bakes bread like you've never tasted before. And even Mother says her pasties are the tastiest in the parish. Father says she's too good for me, but he doesn't mean it. He said it to please me. And she's got eyes. Eyes as blue as cornflowers, hair as gold as ripe corn, and her skin smells like honeysuckle, except when she comes out of the dairy. I keep well away from her then. I've told you about her, Joey, and she was the only one, the only one mind that said I was right to come here and find you. She didn't want me to go. Don't think that. Cried her heart out at the station when I left. So she must love me a little, mustn't she? Come on, you silly you. Say something. That's the only thing I've got against you. Joey, you're the best listener I've ever known, but I never know what the devil you're thinking. You just blink your eyes and waggle those ears of yours from east to west and south to north. I wish you could talk, Joey. I really do. Then one evening, there was terrible news from the front. News that Albert's friend, David, had been killed, along with the two horses that were hauling the vet wagon that day. A stray shell, Albert told me as he brought in the straw from my stable. That's what they said it was. One stray shell out of nowhere, and he's gone. 
I shall miss him, Joey. We shall both miss him, won't we? And he sat down on the straw in the corner of the stable. You know what he was, Joey, before the war? He had a fruit cart in London, outside Covent Garden. Thought the world of you, Joey. Told me so often enough. And he looked after me, Joey. Like a brother he was to me. Twenty years of it. He'd his whole life ahead of him. All wasted now because of one stray shell. He always told me, Joey, he'd say, At least if I goes, there'll be no one that misses me. Only me, cart? And I can't take that with me. More's the pity. He was proud of, proud of his cart. Showed me a photo of himself. Once stood by it. All painted it was and piled high with fruit. And him standing there with a smile like a banana spread all across his face. He looked up at me and brushed the tears down his cheeks. He spoke now through gritted teeth. It's just you and me left now, Joey. And I tell you, we're going to get home. Both of us. I'm going to ring that tenor bell again in the church. I'm going to eat my Maisie's bread and pasties. And I'm going to ride you down the river again. David said he was somehow sure that I'd get home. And he was right. I'm going to make him right. When the end of the war did come, it came swiftly. Almost unexpectedly, it seemed to the men around me. There was little joy, little celebration of victory, only a sense of profound relief that at last it was finished and done with. Albert left the happy cluster of men gathered together in the yard that cold November morning and strolled over to talk to me. Five minutes' time, and it'll be finished. Joey, all over. Jerry's had about enough of it, and so have we. No one really wants to go on anymore. At eleven o'clock the guns will stop, and then that will be that. Only wish that David could have been here to see it. Since David's death, Albert had not been himself. I had not once seen him smile or joke, and he often fell into prolonged brooding silences when he was with me. There was no singing, no more whistling. I tried all that I could to come resting my head on his shoulder and nickering gently to him, but he seemed quite inconsolable. Even the news that the war was finally ended brought no light back into his eyes. The bell in the clock tower over the gateway rang out eleven times, and the men shook each other solemnly by hand, or clapped each other on the back, before returning to the stables. The fruits of victory were to prove bitter indeed for me, but to begin with the end of the war changed little. The vet hospital operated as it always had done, and the flow of sick and injured horses seemed rather to increase than to diminish. From the yard gate we saw the unending columns of fighting men marching jauntily back to the railway stations, and we looked on as the tanks and guns and wagons rolled by on their way home. But we were left where we were. Like the other men, Albert was becoming impatient. Like them, he wanted only to get back home as quickly as possible. Morning parade took place as usual every morning in the centre of the cobbled yard, followed by Major Martin's inspection of the horses and stables. But one dreary, drizzling morning, with the wet cobbles shining grey in the early morning light, Major Martin did not inspect the stables as usual. Sergeant Thunder stood the men at ease, and Major Martin announced the re-embarkation plans for the unit. He was finishing his short speech. So we shall be at Victoria Station by six o'clock on Saturday evening, with any luck. Chances are, you'll all be home by Christmas. But permission to speak, sir? Sergeant Thunder ventured. Carry on, Sergeant. It's about the horses, sir, Sergeant Thunder said. I think the men would like to know what's going to happen to the horses. Will they be with us on the same ship, sir? Or will they be coming along later? Major Martin shifted his feet and looked down at his boots. He spoke softly, as if he did not want to be heard. No, Sergeant, he said. I'm afraid the horses won't be coming with us at all. There was an audible muttering of protest from the parading soldiers. You mean, sir, said the Sergeant, you mean that they'll be coming on a later ship? No, Sergeant, said Major, slapping his side with his swagger stick. I don't mean that. I mean exactly what I said. I mean, they will not be coming with us at all. The horses will be staying in France. Uh, sir, said the sergeant, but how can they, can they, sir? We'll be looking after them. We've got cases here that need attention all day and every day. The major nodded, his eyes still looking at the ground. 
will not like what I have to tell you, he said. I'm afraid a decision has been taken to sell off many of the army's horses here in France. All the horses we have here are either sick or have been sick. It's not considered worthwhile to transport them back home. My orders are to hold a horse sale here in this courtyard tomorrow morning. A notice has been posted in neighbouring towns to that effect. They are to be sold by auction. Auctioned off, sir? Our horses to be put under the hammer after all they've been through? The sergeant spoke politely, but only just. But you know what that means, sir. You know what will happen. Yes, sergeant, said Major Martin. I know what will happen to them. But there's nothing more anyone can do. We're in the so army, sergeant, and I don't have to remind you that orders are orders. But you know what they'll go for, said the sergeant, barely disguising the disgust in his voice. There's thousands of our horses out here in France, sir. War veterans they are. Do you mean to tell me that after all they've been through, after all we've done looking after him, after all you've done, sir, that they'll end up like that? I can't believe they mean it, sir. Well, I'm afraid they do, said the Major stiffly. Some of them may end up as you suggest. I can't deny it, Sergeant. You're every right to be indignant, every right. I'm not too happy about it myself, as you can imagine. But by tomorrow, most of these horses will have been sold off, and we shall be moving out ourselves the day after. And you know, Sergeant, and I know, it's not a blind thing I can do about it. Albert's voice rang out across the yard. What? All of them, sir? Every one of them? Even Joey that we brought back from the dead? Even him? Major Martin said nothing, but turned on his heel and walked away. Wow. Well, Chapter 20 There was an air of determined conspiracy abroad in the yard that day. Whispering groups of men in dripping great coats, their collars turned up to keep the rain from their necks, huddled together, their voices low and earnest. Albert seemed scarcely to notice me all day. He would neither talk to me nor even look at me, but hurried through the daily routine of mucking out, paying up and grooming in a deep and gloomy silence. I knew as every horse in the yard knew that we were threatened. I was torn with anxiety. An ominous shadow had fallen on the yard that morning, and not one of us could settle in our stables. When we were led out for exercise, we were jumpy and skittish, and Albert, like the other soldiers, responded with impatience, jerking sharp, sharply at my halter, something I had never known him to do before. That evening the men were still talking, but now Sergeant Thunder was with them, and they all stood together in a darkening yard. I could just see in the last of the evening light the glint of money in their hands. Sergeant Thunder carried a small tin box, which was being passed around from one to the other, and I heard the clink of coins as they were dropped in. The rain had stopped now, and it was still evening, so that I could just make out Sergeant Thunder's low, growling voice. That's the best we can do, lads, he was saying. It's not a lot, but that we haven't got a lot. Have we? No one ever gets rich in this army. I'll do the bidding like I said. It's against orders, but I'll do it. Mind you, I'm not promising anything. He paused and looked over his shoulder before going on. I'm not supposed to tell you this. The Major said not to. And make no mistake, I'm not in the habit of disobeying officers' orders. But we aren't at war anymore. And anyway, this order was more like advice, so to speak. So I'm telling you this because I wouldn't like you to think badly of the Major. He knows what's going on right enough. Matter of fact, the whole thing was his idea. It was him that told me to suggest it to you in the first place. What's more, lads, he's given us every penny of his pay. That he saved up every penny. It's not much, but it'll help. Of course, I don't have to tell you that no one says a word about this. Not a dicky bird. If this was to get about, then he'd go for the high jump like all of us would. So mum's the word, clear? Have you got enough, Sarge? I could hear that it was Albert's voice speaking. I'm hoping so, son, Sergeant Thunder said, shaking the tin. I'm hoping so. Now let's all of us get shut out. I want you to lay about up bright and early in the morning, and then horses looking their thundering best. It's the last thing we'll be doing for him. The least we can do for him seems to me. The least. And so the group dispersed, the men walking away in twos and threes, shoulders hunched against the cold their hands deep in their great coat pockets.
One man only was left standing by himself in the yard. He stood for a moment looking up at the sky before walking over towards my stable. I could tell it was Albert from the way he walked. It was that rolling farmer's gait with the knees never quite straightening up after each stride. He pushed back his peak cap as he leaned over the stable door. Done all I can, Joey, he said. We all have. I can't tell you any more because I know you'd understand every word I said and then you'd only worry yourself sick with it. This time, Joey, I can't even make you a promise like I did when Father sold you off to the army. I can't promise you a promise because I don't know whether I can keep it. I asked Old Thunder to help and he helped. I asked the Major to help and he helped. And now I've just asked God because when all's said and done, it's all up to him. We've done all we can, that's for certain. I remember old Miss Whittle telling me in Sunday school back once home, God helps those that help themselves. Mean old devil she was, but she knew her scriptures right enough. God bless you, Joey. Sleep tight. And then he put out <coughs> his clenched fist and rubbed my muzzle, and then stroked each of my ears in turn before leaving me alone in the dark of the stables. It was the first time he had talked to me like that, since the day David had been reported killed and it warmed my heart just to listen to him. The day dawned bright over the clock tower, throwing the long, lean shadows of the poplars beyond, across the cobbles that glistened with frost. Albert was up with the others before reveal was blown, so that by the time the first buyers arrived in the yard in their carts and cars, I was fed and watered and groomed so hard that my winter coat gleamed red as I was led out into the morning sun. The buyers were gathered in the middle of the yard, and we were led, all those that could walk, around the perimeter of the yard in a grand parade, before being brought out one by one to face the auctioneer and the buyers. I found myself waiting in my stable watching every horse in the yard being sold ahead of me. I was, it seemed, to be the last to be brought out. Distant echoes of an earlier auction sent me suddenly into feverish sweat, but I forced myself to remember Albert's reassuring words the night before and in time my heart stopped racing. So when Albert led me out into the yard, I was calm and easy in my stride. I had unswerving faith in him, as he patted my neck gently and whispered secretly in my ear. There were audible and visible signs of approval from the buyers as he walked around me in a tight circle, bringing me at last to a standstill, still facing a line of red craggy faces and grasping greedy eyes. Then I noticed amongst the shabby coats and the hats of the buyers a still tall figure of Sergeant Thunder towering above them, and to one side the entire every unit lined up along the walls and watching the proceedings anxiously. The bidding began. I was clearly much in demand for the bidding was swift to start with, but as the price rose I could see more heads shaking and very soon there seemed to be only two bidders left. One was old Thunder himself, who would touch the corner of his cap with his stick, almost like a salute to make his bid, and the other was a thin, wiry little man with weasel eyes, who wore on his face a smile so full of consummate greed and evil that I could hardly bear to look at him. Still the price moved up. At twenty-five, twenty-six, at twenty-seven, twenty-seven I'm bid. On my right, twenty-seven I'm bid. Any more, please? It's against the sergeant there at twenty-seven. Any more, please? He's a fine young animal, as you can see. Got to be worth a whole lot more than this. Any more, please? But the sergeant was shaking his head now. His eyes looked down and acknowledged defeat. Oh, no, I heard Albert whisper beside me. Dear God, not him. He's one of them, Joey. He's been buying all morning. Old Thunder said he's the butcher from Cambrai. Please, God, no. Well then, if there are no more bits, I'm selling my Sir Serac of Cambrai at 27 um, English pounds. Is that all? Selling them for 27? Going, go, 28, came a voice from amongst the buyers, and I saw a white-haired old man leaning heavily on his stick, shuffle, sl shuffle slowly forward through the buyers until he stood in front of them. I'm bidding you 28 of your English pounds, said the old man, speaking in hesitant English, and I'll bid for so long and so high as I need to. I advise you, sir, he said, turning to the butcher from Cambrai. I advise you not to try to bid me out. For this horse I'll pay 100 English pounds if I must do so. No one will have that, this horse except me. 
This is my Emily's horse. It is hers by right. Before he spoke her name, I had not been quite sure that my eyes and ears were not dis deceiving me, for the old man had aged many years since I had last set eyes on him, and his voice was thinner and weaker than I remembered. But now I was sure. This was indeed Emily's grandfather standing before me, his mouth set with grim determination, his eyes glaring around him, challenging anyone to try to outbid him. No one said a word. The butcher from Cambrai shook his head and turned away. Even the auctioneer had been stunned into silence, and there was some delay before he brought his hammer down on the table, and I was sold. I didn't think it was going to end that way, did you? This is our last chapter, chapter 21. There was a look of resigned dejection on Sergeant Thunder's face as he and Major Martin spoke together with Emily's grandfather after the sale. The yard was empty now of horses, and the buyers were all driving away. Albert and his friends stood around me, commiserating with each other, all of them trying to comfort Albert. No need to worry, Albert, one of them was saying. After all, could have been worse. Could have, couldn't it? I mean, a lot more. A half of our horses have gone to the butchers, and that's for definite. At least we know Joe is safe enough with that old farmer man. How do you know that? Albert asked. How do you know he's a farmer? I heard him telling old Thunder, didn't I? Heard him saying he's got a farm down in the valley. Told Old Thunder that Joey would never have to work again so long as he lived. He kept rabbiting on about a girl called Emily or something. Couldn't understand half of what he was saying. Don't know what to make of him, said Albert. Sounds mad as a hat the way he goes on. Emily's horse by right? Whoever she may be. Isn't that what the old man said? What the devil did he mean by that? If Joey belongs to anyone by right, then he belongs to the army. And if he doesn't belong to the army, he belongs to me. Better ask him yourself, Albert said someone else. He has your chance. He's coming over this way with Major and Old Thunder. Albert stood with his arm under my chin, his hand reaching up to scratch me behind my ear, just where he knew I liked it best. As the Major came closer, though, he took his hand away, came to attention, and saluted smartly. Begging your pardon, sir, he said. I'd like to thank you for what you did, sir. I know what you did, sir, and I'm grateful. Not your fault we didn't quite make it. But thanks all the same, sir. I don't know what he's talking about, said Major Martin. Do you, Sergeant? Can't imagine, sir, said Sergeant Thunder. They get like that, you know, sir, these farming lads. It's because they bring up on cider instead of milk. It's true, sir. Goes to their eggs, sir. Must do, mustn't it? Begging your pardon, sir, Albert went on, puzzled by their levity. I'd like to ask the Frenchman since he's gone and bought my joey. I'd like to ask him about what he said, sir, about this Emily, whatever she was called. It's a long story, said Major Martin, and he turned to the old man. Perhaps you would like to tell him yourself, monsieur. This is the young man we were speaking of, the one who grew up with a horse and who came all the way to France just to look for him. Emily's grandfather stood looking sternly up at my Albert from under his bushy white eyebrows, and then his face cracked suddenly and he held out his hand and smiled. Although surprised, Albert reached and shook his hand. So, young man, we have much in common, you and I. I am French, and you are Tommy. True. I am old, and you are young. But we share a love for this horse, do we not? And I am told by the officer here that at home in England, you are a farmer like I am. It is the best thing to be, and I say that with the wisdom of years behind me. What do you keep on your farm? Sheep, sir, mostly, a few beef cattle and some pigs, said Albert. Plough a few fields of barley as well. So it was you that trained the horse to be a farm horse, said the old man. You did well, my son, very well. I can see the question in your eyes before you ask it, so I'll tell you how I know. You see, your horse and I are old friends. He came to live with us. Oh, it was a long time ago now, not long after the war began. He was captured by the Germans, and they used him for pulling the ambulance car from the hospital to the front line and back again. There was with him another wonderful horse, a great shining black horse, and the two of them came to live in our farm that was, the near, that was near the German field hospital. My little granddaughter Emily cared for them and came to love them like her own family. I was all the family she had left. The war had taken the rest. The horses lived with us for maybe a year, maybe less, maybe more. It does not matter. The Germans were kind and gave us the horses when they left. 
and so they became ours, Emily's and mine. Then one day they came back, different Germans, not kind like the others. They needed horses for their guns, and so they took our horses away with them when they left. There was nothing I could do. After that, my Emily lost the will to live. She was a sick child anyway. But now, with her family dead and her new family taken away, she no longer had anything to live for. She just faded away and died last year. She was only 15 years old. But before she died, she made me promise her that I would find the horses somehow and look after them. I've been to many horse sales, but I've never found the other one, the black one. But now at last, I found one of them to take home and care for, as I promised Emily. He leaned more heavily on his stick now with both hands. He spoke slowly, choosing his words carefully. Tommy, he went on, you are a farmer, a British farmer, and you will understand. <coughs> Pardon me. That a farmer, whether he's British or French, even a Belgian farmer, never gives things away. You can never afford to. We have to live, do we not? Your major and your sergeant have told me how much you love this horse. They told me how every one of these men tried so hard to buy this horse. I think that is a noble thing. I think my Emily would have liked that. I think she would have understand. Sorry, I think she would have under. Yeah, I think she would understand that you'd want me to do what I will do now. I'm an old man. What would I do with my Emily's horse? He cannot grow fat in a field all his life, and soon I will be too old to look after him anyway. And if I remember him well, and I do, he loves to work, does he not? I have, how you say, a proposition to make you. I will sell my Emily's horse to you. Sell? said Albert. But I cannot pay you enough to buy him. You must know that. We collected only 26 pounds between us, and you paid 28 pounds. How can I afford to buy him from you now? You do not understand, my friend. The old man said, suppressing a chuckle. You do not understand at all. I will sell you this horse for one English penny and for a solemn promise that you will always love this horse as much as my Emily did and that you will care for him until the end of his days. And more than this, I want you to tell everyone about my Emily and about how she looked after your Joey and the great black horse when they came to live with us. You see, my friend, I want my Emily to live on in people's hearts. I shall die soon, in a few years, no more, and then no one will remember my Emily as she was. I have no other family left alive to remember her. She will be just a name on a gravestone that no one will read. So I want you to tell your friends at home about my Emily. Otherwise, it will be as if she has never even lived. Will you do this for me? That way she will live forever, and that is what I want. Is it a bargain between us? Albert said nothing, for he was too moved to speak. He simply held out his hand in acceptance. But the old man ignored it, put his hands on Albert's shoulder, and kissed him on both cheeks. Thank you, he said. And then he turned and shook hands with every soldier in the unit, and at last hobbled back and stood in front of me. Goodbye, my friend, he said, and he touched me lightly on my nose with his lips. From Emily, he said, and then walked away. He had gone only a few paces before he stopped and turned around. Wagging his knobbly stick and with a mocking, accusing grin across his face, he said, Then it is true what we say, that there is only one thing at which the English are better than the French. They are meaner. You have not paid me my English penny, my friend. Sergeant Thunder produced a penny from the tin and gave it to Albert, who ran over to Emily's grandpa. I shall treasure it, said the old man. I shall treasure it always. And so I came home from the war that Christmas time with my Albert riding me up into the village, and there to greet us was the silver band from Hathaloo and the rapturous pealing of the church bells. Both of us were received like conquering heroes, but we both knew that the real heroes had not come home, that they were lying out in France alongside Captain Nichols, Topthorne, Frederick, David, and little Emily. My Albert married his Macy Cobbledick, as he said he would, but I think she never took to me, nor I to her for that matter. Perhaps it was a feeling of mutual jealousy. I went back to my work on the land with dear old Zoe, who seemed ageless and tireless, and Albert took over the farm again and went back to ringing his tenor bell. He talked to me of many things after that, of his ageing father who doted on me now almost as much as his own grandchildren, and of the vagaries of the weather and the markets. 
and of course about Macy, whose crusty bread was every bit as good as he had said. But try as I might, I never got to eat any of her pasties, and do you know, she never even offered me one. Well, that is the end, grade 7. I do hope you have um, enjoyed this book. There are many, many books by Michael Perger, and I do hope that you'll be encouraged to read them. And so, guys, um, yeah, if you have any questions about this book or any other recommendations you'd like me to give you, you can email me at grade7 at worksheetcloud.com and then look for the activity at the end. So, thanks again for joining me. This lesson was brought to you by Worksheet Cloud, and you know where I will be. Same time, same place. Bye, grade 7s.